Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us here today. In the second quarter, the Options Industry Council is going to focus on selling options, what you need to know, and various strategies and spreads that involve selling options. We'll get started with the basics, some key concepts that you need to know about selling options. My name is Ed Modlow, the Director of Retail Education for the Options Industry Council. Got my career started on the trading floors in Chicago and New York in the late 90s and then moved to electronic trading before entering the brokerage and now service side of the industry. So today we'll be taking a basic level view, but we'll get into some further details that might be a little more intermediate. So hopefully we'll have something for everybody here. First, our disclaimer, options are unique and complex tools. You need to have a thorough understanding of the product before using them in a live account. I will be walking through some examples and graphs today. The numbers that you see on the board will not include some costs such as commission fees, margins, and interests. Those are important costs in a live account, but we'll keep things simple today and ignore those costs. OIC was founded in 1992 to provide free and unbiased education about options to the public. The exchange has founded us to dispel myths on the options product, and we've been doing that for going on 27 years. Most of the education is on our website at optionseducation.org. We have plenty of podcasts, videos, and webinars that you can find on our website. Also, make use of the investor services team at options at the OCC.com. That team is managed by Mark Benzaquin, who is behind the scenes today online answering your questions. So those of you who are tuned in, feel free to type away your questions. Mark is going to be answering as many as he can, and those he can't get to, him and his team will be following up most likely in the next day or two, answering all the questions. So every single question, every comment, every criticism, every critique you provide gets looked at and analyzed, and I actually ask please to uh, follow that up as well with by taking our survey at the end of the presentation. Your feedback is very important to us. It helps shape our program in the future. So make sure to take the survey, leave your feedback, so we can check that out. Here is the options exchanges, the five parent exchanges, and this is where all the action takes place. Every option order gets sent to one of these exchanges. They are also the entities who decide which symbols get listed options, what expiration dates are listed, what strike price intervals are listed, and so forth. They make the decisions. And, of course, these exchanges are trying to give the public as much uh, trading activity or, or possibilities as they possibly can for the most high volume symbols, you will see more expiration dates and strike prices such as weeklies and leaps and shorter intervals between strikes. The exchanges intends to give the public as much as it wants because they're interested in volume, but they don't take that decision lightly. Uh, but the exchanges are the ones driving the industry, which has been thriving. You see here annual growth, over the years, certainly a huge uptick at the turn of the century, but focusing on the more recent years, in 2011, we had a high volatility year with the European sovereign debt crisis and a lot of options volume. We tapered off from there, but centered in and around that $4 billion contract mark annually during periods of incredibly low volatility. That was a positive sign for the industry. And then last year, when we had a spike in volatility, we set a new record, over 5 billion contracts cleared, and off to a very strong start in 2019. So let's get started with our presentation today. As I said, for all sessions this quarter, we're going to be focused on the sell side of options, but of course, having an understanding of the buy side is important too. Today, for the beginning part, we'll stick with the basics and make sure everyone has that foundation. What are rights and obligations? What do they mean for calls and for puts? and some key terminology, moneyness, time value, and theta. And maybe we'll get a little deeper from some back office and uh, clearing perspective, the exercise and assignment procedure, what that's all about, and then very specific to selling options, what is pin risk. We'll close that up. And again, all along the way, type your questions through, uh, and Mark, who will be presenting for us next week, is behind the scenes answering those questions. So let's start from the ground floor. The absolute basics, rights and obligations. First of all, for call buyers, if you purchase a call option, let's remember you pay up front a non-refundable amount, that's the option premium amount, and in exchange for that payment, you own the right 
to buy shares at a certain price called the strike price, and you own that right for a certain length of time. That's the time till expiration or the expiration date that will be listed or defined within the options contract. Of course, those details, what price can you buy it for and how long do you own this right for, those uh, go a long way to determining what the open market value of that contract will be. If you buy a call and you have the right to buy shares at a fixed price, of course, you want the market to go higher and continue to move higher. So the right to purchase shares at that price keeps looking better and better and gets more valuable. That means you have a bullish outlook. So you're trying to take advantage of rising share prices without actually having to buy shares. Your cost is going to be much less than if you bought shares in the open market. You can spend your capital more wisely. However, you do have to overcome that premium that you spent up front for the option in order to be profitable. In other words, at expiration time, the stock will have to have risen above your strike price by an amount at least equal to your cost for the option itself. Uh, that means your break-even point on the call is likely to be higher than your break-even point if you purchase shares. So there's the give and take with call buying. You can take advantage of rising prices. You can spend less cash, but your break-even point is higher as compared to uh, buying shares of stock. Also, another benefit of call buying, the amount of the premium you paid is all you can lose. That's 100% of premium paid. That's your limited loss. The value of the call you own cannot go any lower than zero, so you have very well-defined risk. Looking at the put side, if you purchase a put option, just like purchasing any option, you pay upfront the non-refundable premium amount. And in the case of puts, you own the right to sell shares at the strike price, which is the agreed upon price, and you own that right for a certain length of time. A put buyer absent any other position in their account, an outright put buyer, is bearish on the market. The right to sell shares at a fixed price gains value as the stock price drops lower and lower. So that is bearish trying to take advantage of falling stock prices without having to short shares of stock. Similar to the call buying you would need that stock to drop below your strike price by an amount at least equal to your cost of the put before you start to profit. And of course, your risk is the same. You own an option, you paid for it up front, the worst that can happen is it drops to a value of zero and that's limited your loss to 100% of premium paid. Now in general, looking at call and put buyers together and just speaking from the buy side, from a broad perspective, Buyers of options are generally speculators, again, absent other positions like another options position or a stock position, just outright call and put buyers are speculative in nature. They are anticipating or their market outlook is telling them that the stock is going to move one way or the other, and they have a strong opinion on the direction of that move, the magnitude of that move, and the timing of that move. So buying options becomes their trade as a speculative nature. They're, they're willing to pay and have time decay, which we'll cover later, work against them because their market outlook is confident enough that they will be able to overcome that with the market move they expect to happen. So that's call buyers and put buyers, what rights they have, and a broad perspective on the motivations of why call and put buyers choose to use options instead of stock trades. We want to focus most of our, our attention today on the sell side. So at the most basic level, call sellers are paid premium up front. They are received cash for the option they sell. They are now under the obligation to sell shares of stock at the strike price if they're assigned. Call sellers are comfortable with being assigned at the strike price. As an outright trade, Without any other position, a call seller is bearish. They're under the obligation to sell shares at a strike price. They want the stock to move away from that strike price or lower. So bearish in nature will help decrease the value of that option, and that's what the call seller is looking for. More likely than not, call sellers, and for most of you this will be the case, 
are not selling calls outright. We'll outline the risk profile of this trade here on the next slide, but I'll point out right now that more than likely you are an owner of shares of stock and you are selling a call option against it, which will flip the risk profile dramatically. And I'll cover that as the covered call position briefly in a couple of slides. The risk of the call seller outright is theoretically unlimited. If you're obligated to deliver shares of stock at a certain price, then the higher and higher that stock price goes, the worse that trade gets for you. And there is no defined upper boundary on how high a stock price can go. So in theory, a call seller has unlimited risk to the upside. Looking at the put side, similar to the call seller, a put seller or writer is paid up front the option premium amount and has taken on an obligation. The difference here is that the obligation is to buy shares or purchase shares at the strike price if assigned. As an outright position, the way to profit by selling puts is to keep the stock away from the put strike. That means the higher the stock goes, the further it moves away from your strike. And that's why you see typically bullish in nature or um, intermediate, bearish, long-term bullish. Or even if you are neutral and expecting the stock to consolidate, you can uh, profit by selling a put in those market conditions. Your benefit is receiving that income. And as, again, as we'll cover in a few slides, you might actually be looking to buy shares or be very happy with taking assignments at the strike price. As an outright trade, risk here is not unlimited, but substantial. We're under the obligation to purchase shares at the strike price. If the stock drops, we will continue to mount losses. But of course, stock prices are bounded by zero. They can't go any lower than that. So while risk is substantial, it is not unlimited like it is in the case of call options. So let's start by breaking these apart on P&L graphs, and then we'll take a quick look at common strategies that are used to sell calls and sell puts. First of all, the graph of selling a naked call, as I said, unlimited risk to the upside, and you can see that here in our example, stock XYZ. We're choosing the 50 strike call option, selling it for $2. We're bearish or neutral on the stock. Or we might think implied volatility is decreasing. If implied vol decreases, the option premium will likely decrease as well. The motivation for this trade is to generate income and to execute this trade in a different fashion than taking other bearish or short delta positions. Our break even here is 52 because we sold the option for $2. If you're looking at this thinking, well, some of you might be, uh, be willing or um, allowed to sell stock short in your account, you might say, well, that's a lot of risk to the upside selling a naked call option for not much benefit if the stock does drop. If I sell shares with each move lower, with each dollar move lower in the stock, I'm making more and more money being short stock with similar risk to the upside. And that is true. Uh, the difference here with selling calls is you have that buffer. In this case, if the stock was trading at $50 a share and you sold short at that level, that becomes your break even. If you sell a call option instead, you now have a $2 buffer, or in this case, that would represent a 4% move in the stock against you before you reach your break even point. That's the benefit of selling naked calls versus selling short stock. You improve your break even which improves your likelihood of being successful on the trade, and you give up uh, the possibility for big profits should the stock move lower. That's selling a naked call, arguably the most risky trade you can do in the options space. I would expect it to require the highest level of approval in your options account. Uh, many of you may never make this trade, but it's perfectly fine to uh, understand it and it's important to be familiar with what it means because if you're not selling naked calls, there's a very good chance you are selling calls within other strategies. We'll touch out a little bit on that today. Here's your max gain. As you see on the chart, $200. That's the most we can make. If we sell this option for two, it can only go to zero, and that is the maximum possibility for our profit and 
there's the max loss. It's unlimited to the upside as the stock continues to move higher and higher. We stand to lose more and more as the stock rallies. Selling naked put options is going to look very similar, but from the opposite perspective. If the stock is trading right around $50 a share, and we look at the XYZ 50 put option that's trading for $2. Now, if we're neutral to bullish, we can sell a put versus buying shares of stock. In this case, we would receive $2 and have achieved a break-even of $48. Our maximum gain is similar to before, just the amount of premium we received up front, that's $200, and max risk to the downside is substantial. The stock can go down but cannot go below zero. That's as bad as it can get. So you see here, just as with the calls, we have $2, a $2 buffer from the current level, assuming stock is at 50. Our break-even point is a solid 4% below that, and that's the value you get by selling options. It improves your break-even points versus just owning or selling shares outright. And when you improve break-even points, you're increasing the probability of profit on your trade. So that's the outright positions of selling the naked call and naked put. More commonly for most of you, here's a couple of strategies that you might be more willing and capable of executing with selling of calls and selling of puts. First, the covered call. For those of you trading options out there, you're probably very familiar with this strategy and you may be already using it. This involves writing or selling one call option for each 100 shares of stock already owned. If you execute both of those sides together, it's usually called a buy right. But in this case, the covered call would entail owning 100 shares of stock and then at some point in time, selling a call option against it. What you're doing is generating additional income and lowering your initial cost. When you purchased 100 shares, you paid for them. If you then sell a call option, you're receiving cash back. That reduces your total cost on the trade, which lowers your potential loss, lowers your risk, and improves your break-even point. You're still bullish. Your stock position is going to drive the P&L of this position, so you're still at least somewhat bullish on the trade, hoping to capitalize on further moves higher in the stock price, but you're selling a call option to give you a buffer, generate a little bit of additional income, and selling a call at a strike price where you're perfectly comfortable delivering shares of stock or selling shares of stock. Some, in somewhat, not an identical way, but in a, a general perspective, you are using the short call option as a limit order to sell shares of stock at the strike price of the call. Potential benefits would include two pieces. First of all, that move higher from where the stock is currently trading up to the strike price of the short call, plus the premium received from the short call when you sold it to begin with. That would be what you can gain on the covered call position moving forward. Again, that's the stock moving higher to your strike, at which point you have to sell or deliver those shares, and the option premium you received up front. Your risk is certainly substantial. Your long stock is not protected to the downside in any significant way. The premium from the call buffers you a little bit, but your risk to the downside is certainly substantial. If the stock drops dramatically, you will experience losses. Those losses would be less than if you own stock outright without having sold the call, but they still would be substantial. So that's the covered call position. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And just as popular is the cash secured put. This involves selling a put option, but also having cash set aside. In case assignment occurs, you are ready, willing, and able to purchase those shares at the strike price. In fact, with the cash secured put, it is often the case that you want shares of stock. And that's why we say the goal is to be assigned in order to buy stock below current market prices. Effectively, you are selling a put option and using it as a limit order or a substitute for a limit order to buy shares at a lower level. So selling a put option, receiving premium, and putting yourself under the obligation to purchase shares of stock at a strike price that you are comfortable purchasing stock at. As an outright trade in order to profit from selling a put, 
a neutral or moderate, moderately bullish perspective would be consistent. If that happens and the put expires worthless, then you certainly will expect a profit, uh, expecting the put option to expire without any value. The benefit is premium received up front. And if you're wrong on your market outlook, uh, you do have a buffer. If the stock drops in this case, we're willing to purchase shares where we're comfortable purchasing them. If the stock is neutral or if it rallies, then we will accept a small profit in the amount of the premium we received up front. The risks to the downside very similar to the covered call. In fact, they're the same. If the stock price continues to drop, we are under the obligation to purchase shares. So as the price goes lower and lower and lower, theoretically could go all the way down to zero, we are obligated to buy shares at the strike. So that is substantial, but bounded by the strike price. Now, when you sell a cash secured put, you are usually using an out of the money or an at the money option, although you could use an in the money option as well. And that would determine your aggressiveness or your risk tolerance on the trade. The more aggressive you would like to be and the more premium you're willing to receive, uh, you can use a higher strike price. So that takes us to our next section here, this concept of in the money, at the money, and out of the money. Some of you might not be too familiar with that. A term that is used to describe this concept is moneyness. That's a catch-all for these three conditions, in, at, or out of the money. On the call side and the put side, I can use the same definition. Looking at this from the buyer or holder's perspective, if an option holder owns the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock at a more favorable price than they could get in the open market, then that would be an in-the-money option. I'll say that again. If the option holder has the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock at a better price than the open market is offering, then that's an in-the-money option. If it's at a worse price than the open market is offering, that's out of the money. And if those two prices equal each other, that's at the money. So for calls, if the holder of the option has a strike price below the stock price, then that's better. They own the right to buy shares at the strike price, which is a better price than the current value of the stock. So that's an in-the-money option. If they own a, a call option that has a strike price above the stock price, or they have the right to buy shares higher than where the stock price currently is, that's an out-of-the-money option, and that's for calls. Put options work the same way. If the put holder owns the right to purchase, uh, owns the right to sell shares at a strike price greater than the stock price, then that's better than the open market is offering, and that's an in-the-money option. If the put holder has the right to sell shares at the strike price, which is below the current value of the stock price, then that is an out-of-the-money option. It's very simple to understand these terms and also important because you'll use this as you analyze an option's premium amount. It's also important to point out that when it comes to this relationship between moneyness and profit, an in-the-money option has really no direct effect or no bearing on the profitability of the trade. So the moneyness does not equal profit. In, a, in our call example, if we owned a call option with a strike price of 50 and the stock price is at 52, that's an in-the-money option. We own the right to buy shares at 50 and the stock price is $2 above that. We have $2 of value to extract from that. But that has nothing to do with profitability. We may have paid $3 for that option. And now we can only extract $2 from it. So an in-the-money option means it has value. There's something there to extract. But it does not mean we have a profit. Now these three terms are going to be very important when we start to calculate the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic value. In-the-money options have inherent value, intrinsic value. As I said, using the same numbers as before, if the strike is 50 and the stock is at 52, and we own a call option at that strike price, we would expect there to be at least $2 in value. There's inherently $2 there that we would expect to see. And as we go through 
uh, the next section on time value, we'll see that becomes the intrinsic value and the stock price movements are going to be the driving influence on the change in the intrinsic value or that in the money amount. If there is no intrinsic value, that means the option is not in the money. There's no inherent value there. So for at the money and out of the money options, they don't have any intrinsic value. All of their value is time value. Time value is otherwise known as extrinsic value. Those two terms are used interchangeably. Time value is the amount of premium above its intrinsic value. That's how you calculate it. You back out time value by analyzing what the option is trading for or what it's worth in the open market against what the intrinsic value is. The difference between the two is going to be the time value. Look at an example, shares trading 77 half. We are looking at the 75 strike call option in the open market, it's trading for $3.50. So our first question is if this call option is in the money or not. Well, the call holder has the right to buy shares at 75. That's better than 77 half. So yes, it is in the money. It has intrinsic value. The simple arithmetic is 77 half minus 75. That leaves us with $2.50 of intrinsic value. The difference between the open market value of 350 and the intrinsic value of 250 is $1. So with very basic, simple calculations, we can break out that 350 premium and determine how much is intrinsic and how much is extrinsic. For in-the-money options, as you trade more and more, this will become second nature, and you'll be able to do it in a split second. As I said, for at-the-money and out-of-the-money options, it's more simple. There is no intrinsic value. So everything you see for the option premium is its time value. There are many factors that go into time value, and that's why it is uh, used, the, the term used is extrinsic value more commonly, because I don't want people to get confused by thinking that time value is only sensitive to the passage of time. It really isn't. It certainly is a driving factor and influence, but there is more than just days to expiration and the change in time to expiration that affects time value. So uh, time value, otherwise known as extrinsic value, is going to have variables that include days to expiration and, most importantly, Volatility, specifically implied volatility. What does the market per perceive as the volatility of future stock price movements? Of course, that's going to have a huge effect on what the open market value of an option is. If the market starts to perceive more uncertainty in the future and the possibility for wider, larger swings in the stock price, then you would expect the option price to increase as implied volatility increases. You can see here with these other factors, dividends and interest rates, which are generally known confirmed numbers, with each passing day, the effect of the passage of time certainly uh, draws down the option premium, You should, or I would say has a negative influence on the options premium. However, increases in volatility can have the opposite effect. So you certainly can have one or two or three days pass, but implied volatility increase, which actually increases the extrinsic value of the option. A little bit counterintuitive, all else equal, if time decreases, but implied volatility for whatever reason increases, those two conflicting uh, forces could actually drive up the price of the option even with less days to expiration. As I said before, if intrinsic value is zero, the option is not in the money. It's at the money or out of the money, and the calculation is much more simple. Everything you see, all of that premium on the board, is going to be time value. Now, this is a really important concept, and as you trade in the money options, you'll be doing these calculations very quickly. So let's do a fun quiz to make sure we all understand how this works. We're going to put up an option on the left side and then calculate the right side, fill in the blanks. First one is the 85 strike price call option with the stock at 88. 
and our market chain, our options chain is showing the value of this option at 475. Is this in the money, at the money, or out of the money? And then what are the two pieces? So the 85 call, the holder of this call option has the right to purchase shares at 85. Stock price is up at 88. 85 is better than 88, so it is indeed in the money. Since it's in the money, it does have intrinsic value. That's simply the difference between stock price and option strike price. That's $3. And the time value is whatever is remaining above that. So if the option is trading for $4.75 and we back out, calculate the intrinsic value at three, time value is what's left. That's $1.75. Let's do a few more of these. Look at a put option. Strike price here is 72 half, and the stock price in the open market is 72 even. Again, from the put holder's perspective, they own the right to sell shares at 72 half. That's better than the open market price of 72, so this would also be an in-the-money option. The amount that it's in the money by is 50 cents. That becomes our intrinsic value, and then all premium above that is the time value, and that would be $1.70 minus the intrinsic of $0.50, cents, and time value is $1.20. Let's look at another call example. Strike price here is 20 The call holder has the right to purchase shares at 20 That's worse than the open market price of 19 The open market value of the option is $1.30. So this is an out-of-the-money option, which means it has no intrinsic value, all of the premium, all of the dollar thirty there is going to be time value or extrinsic value. And the last one we'll do a twenty seven half put, twenty seven half stock price. Option price is at seventy five cents. This will be an at the money option, no intrinsic or inherent value, and all of the premium that seventy five cents is going to be time value. This is important to be able to calculate. So as I said before, the intrinsic value will change as the stock moves, as the relationship or the distance between the stock price and the strike price moves higher or lower, gets greater or decreases. That is going to influence the intrinsic value. Time value is going to be zero at expiration. We know that. There is no more time left at expiration, so it will be zero. But Prior to expiration, time value might not necessarily decrease every day. With each passing day, there's a negative effect on the amount of time value, but open market forces, specifically implied volatility, could increase the amount of time value that you see in the options contract. So that is the part that is going to have a couple of influencing factors, specifically time and implied volatility. Now, when, you, when I refer to the time aspect or the negative aspect of each day passing, that can be quantified, and that is known as the Greek of theta. For those of you who are, who are new to options and you're beginning, uh, I don't want to scare off anyone with these Greek terms. They're actually very simple to understand, and if you've ever traded options or evaluated an options price, you undoubtedly have done a Greek analysis even if you didn't know it or didn't realize it. Theta is just simply how much do we expect this options value to change with the passage of time. Usually it's one day. We're going to walk through an example on the next slide, but usually it's one day. How much do we expect the option value to change with the passage of time? This is going to have a negative effect on the options price. You see, calls and puts both have negative theta amounts. That's because the value will drop. It will go lower. Now, from a position perspective, long calls and long puts have negative thetas. They lose value, or that's a negative effect on your account. But if you're short, and we're focused on the short side here with our presentation today, if you're short an option, either a call or put, your position actually has a positive theta because with each passing day, that negative influence on the stock price is going to have a positive effect on your account. That's what you're trying to capture here 
when you sell options is that theta amount. It's going to be a little more clear as we walk through an example, but usually when you see a theta amount, it's expressed in one day, but it could be different. It's worth making sure and checking whatever data vendor you're using that they are using a one day or possibly a different time frame when they're expressing their data term. And that's per calendar day. That's not trading days. It is true that weekends come out. There are three days that come out over a weekend or possibly a, a holiday weekend would have more than that. Uh, but for anybody thinking that you can sell an option on a Friday afternoon and automatically capture three days of theta decay come Monday morning, giving you an advantage, uh, things usually aren't that easy. And I can speak to my experience many years in the business, working for various uh, professional trading firms. Uh, at some point in time, on Friday morning or Friday afternoon, professional traders will start to price options using three days less to expiration. Effectively, they want to look at what prices will be all else equal on Monday morning versus Friday afternoon. And those traders are smart. They're not going to get let people get away with any free money. It's not generally possible to go in and sell options on Friday afternoon and expect to get a quick profit come Monday morning. Trading firms are usually pricing their options on Friday afternoon looking ahead to what those options would be priced at when they roll around to Monday morning. But from an educational perspective, theta amounts are usually listed as one-day decays, and that is per calendar day, not trading day. From the buyer's perspective, if you're paying for theta, you're paying for time. You expect or hope the stock moves in your favor. As I said earlier, when you're a call buyer or a put buyer, you are speculating on a market move. You need that to happen within a certain time frame. You are paying for the right to own a contract that gives you to the right to buy or sell shares of stock at a certain price for a certain length of time, and you are anticipating that the movement in stock will be great enough in your favor that it will offset any loss you may incur with the passage of time. That's the buyer's perspective. Sellers of options or writers of options contracts are selling that time. Sellers of contracts are trying to capture that natural decay or the negative effect of theta as each day passes. Only time value decays. Intrinsic value doesn't decay, as we said on the previous slide. Intrinsic value is driven by stock price movements and the difference between the stock price and the strike price, but time value or extrinsic value does decay with the intricate detail that implied volatility could actually have a positive effect from one day to the next that outweighs or is more magnified than the negative effect of theta. Now here's an interesting graph we'll put up that just shows the, the idea that options decay differently depending on where they're at. The line you see there, the curved line of at the money options is the one you've probably seen most often. At the money options have more time value, more theta decay than in the money, or you could also say in the money or at the money option. I'm sorry, in the money or out of the money options. At the money options have the most theta, and you see where that curve starts to decelerate or increase its frequency in decay there, usually that's right around the 40 to 45 days till expiration mark where you see the increase in time decay start to take effect on the options price. And just from a conceptual perspective, when you're seeing in the money or out of the money options that decay differently in a more slower, linear fashion throughout its lifespan, in the money options have very little time value and they are slowly approaching a parity as you reach expiration, all else equal. Out of the money options who have little value are approaching zero, uh, but of course, out of the money options are used frequently for protection. So there'd be a slightly different line here for an out of the money options contract. Um, from one day to the next, you might expect a very cheap call or more specifically a put option to continue to lose its value and approach zero, but from a portfolio management perspective, it's very common to purchase cheap options 
to protect against a catastrophic event. It's by the same measure viewed as not worth selling options that are very cheap in nature uh, because of the risk that entails selling those options. So for very cheap options, and I'll specify that on the put side, you see buyers come in for protection at low prices, sellers not wanting to take on the risk of selling cheap options. They somewhat hold their value, and that theta amount that you would expect to see doesn't necessarily get realized in those deep out-of-the-money options. And again, in-the-money options are approaching parity. At the money, you have that tipping point where uh, around 40 to 45 days, the case starts to accelerate and continues to accelerate all the way through expiration. On expiration day, options will be worth zero. So uh, mathematically, on Friday, any option that is at the money that finishes with no value has experienced a 100% decay. That's as fast a decay as you're ever going to get. So options do decay differently. Uh, but it's very important to understand for at-the-money options, the ones, ones that have the most time value or near-the-money options, you start to see theta decay accelerate around that 40 to 45-day mark. Then you've got to find that sweet spot for yourself. If that's the level where you'd like to sell your options contracts or maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later. The later you go, the more premium you're going to get. The sooner you go, the less premium, but the more quick decay you'll get. So each investor will make that decision for themselves. I'm not going to spend too much money on, on each of these numbers, but this is the kind of thing you see with the different days to expiration. You see top to bottom, the amount of days left and the theta amount or how much premium is coming out of this option contract's total premium. That's what theta represents here. And you can see as you go down and have fewer and fewer days till expiration, the theta amount keeps increasing and increasing. And if you look sort of to the bottom of this and you see uh, from 20 to 10 and 10 to 5, that amount is increasing. It goes from earlier being 4 cents, 4 cents, up to 10 cents, and then 14 cents, looking on the calls here. And that's the effect that you'll see as you approach expiration and the days get shorter and shorter till expiration date that theta amount starts to pick up. So we've covered a lot here. We've gone through uh, selling outright positions, a few key strategies, moneyness, intrinsic and extrinsic value, some theta discussion. I want to get through exercise and assignment and define what that's all about. Uh, first of all, we've said this before, buyers have rights. They own the right to purchase or sell shares of stock at a certain strike price, and they can exercise their contract if they choose to do so. Sellers have obligations. They can't choose to be assigned. They are paid up front to take on obligations and leave the choice to the buyer. So let's break down exercise and assignment. The option buyer for a call option has the right to buy shares of stock. And if it's a put option, sell shares of stock. For a standard contract, that's 100 shares of a stock or ETF. And they can execute that transaction at the strike price if, they exercise. In order to exercise, the buyer has to do one of two things, really. If the buyer wants to communicate with their brokerage firm, their intent to exercise, they certainly should have a means by which they can do that. It's also something known as auto X. This is a procedure that makes things a lot easier from a back office perspective within the industry. If an, option, if an options contract finishes in the money, and hopefully we all know what that term means now, in the money, on its expiration date by at least a penny, then that options contract will be exercised on behalf of the holder unless the holder instructs their firm not to do so. That just makes things easier that every single options contract does not have to be communicated to their brokerage firm. The industry, of course, has to have some kind of default process on how they're going to handle exercise should the holder not, conf uh, not confirm or communicate anything. And if the option is in the money, it will be exercised. And if it's at or out of the money, it won't be. That's the way the industry works. If the holder would like to do something differently than that, they have to contact their firm and let them know. Of course, only option buyers can exercise. They paid for the right to do that. And they can communicate with their brokerage firm their intentions whenever they wish. Here's an example. An investor buys a call options trading at $79 a share, the strike price is 80 and they've paid $1.50 for it. Some time has passed, 
and we've reached expiration date. Stock has moved up to 84. Now, the investor has intrinsic value. They own the 80 call options. Stock's trading up at 84. That's $4 of intrinsic value. That would represent 400 total dollars that they can extract from this call contract. They paid $1.50 for it. So as you look at the numbers, the profit is $250. At the moment, that is unrealized profit. That's what they have at their disposal. There's two ways they can extract that value. One of them is to exercise the contract. And if they do so, they have the risk and reward of being long 100 shares at their new price. They have exercised the 80 call, paid $80 a share, add to it what they paid up front, the $1.50 they paid to buy the contract, and they now own 100 shares at a break-even point of $81.50. This leaves them with the still unrealized profit of $250 and long shares which have a risk to the downside. They've also had to pay for these shares. They paid $8,000 to buy shares at the strike price. More often or more frequently than exercising, options holders will close the trade or enter a sell to close order and not ever have to deal with exercise. They didn't want to buy shares in the first place and they may not want to buy them now. So if this stock has rallied up to 84 and we're sitting on expiration date, this holder could also just sell the option and try to get $4 or as close to 4 as they could. And if they did get $4 for their options contract, they would now have a realized profit of $250 and they could close their position. So that's what exercise is. We're looking at sellers. It's important to understand exercise, but let's look at things from the seller's perspective. The option seller has the obligation to either buy or sell shares of stock depending on whether they sold a call or put. They will have to fulfill that obligation if they're assigned an exercise notice. This happens when a firm's brokerage or an investor's brokerage firm notifies them that they have been assigned. And only option sellers can be assigned. They have no choice in the matter. They are at the mercy, if you will, of the option holder who has the decision in their hands. The only way to avoid being assigned is to buy back the contract or enter a buy-to-close transaction and execute that. In other words, to not have an assignable position. That is the only way to guarantee you're not going to be assigned. And one question that comes up that's worth pointing out is assignment does not occur during the trading day. If you begin the trading day with a short assignable position and you close it before the closing bell, you cannot be assigned. Exercise and assignment activity takes place after the closing bell during the PM hours and it goes through a few steps, which we'll cover here in a second. But first our example. We're on the short side of this trade. We've sold the 80 call option with the stock trading 79, same numbers as before. The stock has risen, but now we're on the short side. If we're assigned on the call option, we collect or receive cash in the amount of the strike price times 100, or in this case, $8,000, and we will deliver shares of stock. Our unrealized loss here is $250. And the investor now has the reward and risk profile of being short 100 shares from 81 half. That's if we are assigned and we did not own shares of stock. Backing up to the beginning, having the covered call position, which is much more popular, if you were assigned in that case, then you would be delivering shares that you already owned. And in that case, you would have no position left if you were willing to sell those shares at $80. So there's a process involved. Uh, when assignment occurs, and this is uh, usually new for people uh, to understand exactly how that works. Uh, there's a few pieces involved with the exercise and assignment process. Of course, the one line of communication starts with the holder of the option. They will inform their brokerage firm of their intent to exercise, or their option will be exercised on their behalf if they don't say anything and it expires in the money. What about the back half? Once that has been communicated, OCC will pool together all of the exercise notices that are received or pool together all of the auto exercise contracts that are going to be exercised. And it goes through a mathematical SEC-approved random assignment method 
to assign clearing member firms who have open, short, assignable positions. OCC informs the clearing member firms that they are assigned. The second piece to the puzzle is the clearing member firms then identify which of their clients or investors have open, short, assignable positions, and they go through another round of random assignment, an SEC-approved mathematical process to decide who is going to be assigned. Now, that could happen at the clearing member firm or if there are smaller or brokerage firms that use clearing member firms, it would happen at one of these two levels, whichever level that happens at, ultimately at that point, the investors or the traders are informed that they are assigned. So two parts to the process, it starts with OCC, but OCC does not have any direct ties to any investors or traders accounts. OCC is in business with clearing member firms. After that has been completed, then clearing member firms and or the brokerage firms they're in business with complete their assignment to individuals, and those individuals are notified of assignment. The last thing I want to cover today is very important uh, when you're selling options, and that is pin risk. First of all, what does it mean when you hear this word? A pinning occurs when the stock settles on expiration day very close, if not right at the strike price of the option you have sold. Where this leaves you is with a great amount of uncertainty on whether or not you're going to be assigned. The option does not necessarily have to be in the money for an option holder to exercise it. By that same measure, an option could expire out of the money and the holder may still choose to exercise. This question comes up quite a bit. If a seller is short, say, a put option with a strike price of $25 and they notice on expiration Friday the stock closed at $25.01 or O2. They think they're safe. I hear this question quite a bit. How could I be assigned when the option expires out of the money? Well, it doesn't really matter if it expires out of the money. What's more important is what does the owner of that $25 put want to do? If they, if they owned that put for protection on a stock price, maybe they want to exercise it anyway and get out of their shares at 25 without taking weekend risk. So if an option is near the stock price, you have this high level of uncertainty on whether or not you're going to be assigned, and that is what's known as pin risk. We'll walk through an example with a different price here. If you're short, the 270 put with shares trading just above that heading into the closing bell, you may think you're safe, and you may not want to pay the few pennies that that option is trading for to buy it back. You know if you're assigned, you're obligated to buy $27, $27,000 worth of shares. That's the strike price times 100. But of course, we've all been there. If you don't have to pay anything to close out the position, you may not want to, even if it's only trading for a few, a few pennies. But if you don't do that, you are at risk for either a, an unexpected decision by the option holder or possibly a market move after hours. Even in those few minutes after hours, if the market starts to move or something drastic happens, the option holder has all the way up until the cutoff time of their brokerage firm to decide if they would like to exercise their option. So after hours activity can certain, certainly influence the decision that a holder makes when it comes to exercise and assignment. And sellers have to be aware of that, especially if the strike price and the stock price are very close to one another. Keep in mind the only way to avoid assignment is to not have an assignable position. That means not have an open, short position. I said this before, the one way to completely avoid any uncertainty about being assigned is to buy it back. And you can see it is very possible to close an out-of-the-money position for little cost. You may not want to do that. You may not have to. I've been in many trades myself where I wanted to squeeze every penny I could out of the trade, and I let it go. Uh, but when you do that, you do have to acknowledge the risk that you get assigned unexpectedly or you don't get assigned unexpectedly or there's some kind of market move after hours that changes the perspective of the option holder. You have all of those risks when you don't close an options contract. Buyers do have some time 
we'll say roughly an hour or so, maybe longer, after the closing bell to decide what they want to do with their options contract. Uh, data is normally not released on Fridays, but of course now we have uh, we have expirations more than just Fridays. We have Mondays and Wednesdays for certain symbols, and that could continue uh, in the future. So uh, be aware of aftermarket activity, whether it's data or market conditions that affects whether or not the option is exercised or not, regardless of its in-the-money, out-of-the-money status or moneyness status. So pin risk is very important. Certainly, please check out our uh, at website, we have our options education program. You can take a MyPath quiz, which will place you into our curriculum and suggest some material for you. Also, there's the website address again, optionseducation.org. The investor services team, options at the OCC.com. They answer emails all day long, so please utilize their services. They're there to help, and they will do so as best they can. We're all over social media as well, the OIC YouTube channel. Facebook, and Twitter. If you have questions about what's on the YouTube channel, uh, our investor services team can certainly help you out. We have short videos, we have longer videos, and we have many archived webinars just like this on our YouTube channel. You can check those out. Simply go to YouTube, search for Options Industry Council, and if there's something there uh, that you're looking for and you can't find it, our investor services team will certainly help. Thanks again for your attention today, folks. I'm going to wrap things up. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.